we have uh, Dr. Jeffrey Siegel and, excuse me, wrong button. And Dr. Jeffrey Siegel is the director of the Office of Drug Evaluation Sciences. And so he oversees and leads the um, qualification of drug development tools within um, CEDAR at the FDA. And he's going to provide an overview on qualification and its application to complex in vitro models. Jeff, please come up. Thank you, Nick. Good morning, everyone. Really delighted to be here. In my talk this morning, I'm going to talk about how we're applying the qualification program to this new area of complex in vitro models. I'm going to begin by talking about the different types of drug development tools and where in vitro models, uh, complex in vitro models may fit. Talk about the qualification process for drug development tools, including considerations for complex in vitro models. Then I'll talk about some of the challenges that we face when uh, defining potential contexts of use, and then give you a couple of examples uh, of uh, potential contexts of use that you can think about for your further consideration at this workshop. So it's clear that complex in vitro models have the potential to become uh, valuable drug development tools. Um, currently, the in vitro models that are used um, uh, most commonly are 2D cultures. Um, these have important value, uh, but they have limitations as well because they often represent only a single cell type. And by developing uh, more complex models like 3D organoids, microphysiologic systems, and uh, multi, uh, models of multi-organ physiology, we can add additional elements uh, that are important to physiology uh, to make these in vitro tools more reflective of human physiology and human pathology. And at the bottom of this slide um, are the different uh, complex in vitro models that we're including as part of um, CIVMs, uh, microphysiologic systems, organs on chip, chips, uh, organoids, micropattern cells, and cellular microsystems. So there are many potential uses of complex in vitro models in drug development, and you heard about uh, a number of these from um, Dr. Strauss just before me. Um, one use is potentially screening compounds for efficacy, so in vitro proof of concept, preclinical safety screening, understanding drug mechanism of action, drug metabolism and disposition, and then the important three R's, uh, replacing, reducing, refining animal use in preclinical studies. It's important to realize that some of these uses are really focused on internal pharmaceutical company decision making and are really out of scope for the FDA to qualify, but others may serve regulatory purposes. So for example, screening compounds for efficacy, this isn't really something that the FDA gets involved in. This would be an internal company decision. And similarly, uh, preclinical safety screening would be as well. But replacing animal models for preclinical studies or uh, refining their use, this would fall into uh, the scope of uh, FDA considerations. And um, the last uh, comment I'd like to make about um, the CIVMs in drug development is that for using them in the regulatory uh, setting, uh, we follow similar processes as we do for other drug development tools, such as um, clinical outcome assessments and biomarkers. So this is um, the framework for uh, our consideration of drug development tools. And it's all based on the legislation that was passed in, uh, I believe, 2018, um, the 21st Century Cures Act, uh, which gave the FDA authority to regulate these drug development tools. And as you can see, there are um, three types. Uh, there are biomarkers, there are clinical outcome assessments, and then there's the drug development tool category that doesn't fit into either of these other two. Any other method, material, or measure that the secretary determines aids drug development and regulatory review. One category here are animal models uh, for use under the animal rule. And the other um, fits into the ISTAN program. 
And this is a pilot in my office uh, for qualification of drug development tools that aren't addressed uh, by the other programs. So I stand is a pilot program. It stands for Innovative Science and Technology Approaches for New Drugs. The mission is to accelerate use of novel drug development tools through agency-wide coordination, effective communication, and efficient review. And our vision is to enable the timely incorporation of innovative science and technology approaches into drug development for the benefit of public health. So the way the iStand pilot process works is um, requesters will submit a um, uh, submission to iStand or be referred to iStand, and then it goes into the um, uh, standard three-step qualification process that we use for biomarkers and clinical outcome assessments. And then uh, if it's, uh, um, if the data support qualification, then it will be a qualified drug development tool. The other pathway is for um, drug development tools uh, or concepts that don't fit into um, the framework of qualification of drug development tools. Uh, we have not, um, entered any proposals into this process yet, but this is an open process. It could lead to public meetings, white papers, and guidances. But we're focused on uh, qualifying complex in vitro uh, models as drug development tools for our discussion today. This is the website for the iStand pilot. You can go there to get information on how to submit uh, uh, requests, letters of intent to uh, iStand. So, so far, uh, two letters of intent have been accepted into the iStand pilot, and they're shown here, and this information is available on our public uh, transparency web uh, site database. One is a specificity screening of biotherapeutics for improved safety profiling in IND applications using the membrane proteome array. And you can see this is not either a biomarker or a clinical outcome assessment, but it's clearly a drug development tool that can aid drug development programs uh, widely. And the second letter of intent that's been accepted is for local tolerance of epidurally or uh, intrathecally administered leachables in vitro. Um, and I can share that we have received submissions for complex in vitro models into the uh, iStand program. None of, has been accepted to date. And one of the issues is that some of the context of use have in fact really been for internal company decision making and really don't fit into the uh, FDA purview. But I'll discuss that more as we go along. So what is qualification? Um, qualification is a conclusion that within the stated context of use, the drug development tool can be relied upon to have a specific interpretation and application in drug development and regulatory review. Once a drug development tool is qualified, it will be publicly available to be used in any drug development program for the qualified context of use. And the qualified drug development tool generally can be included in IND, NDA, or BLA submissions without needing FDA to reconsider or confirm, reconfirm its suitability. When we qualify a drug development tool, uh, we think about the specific context of use, and that drives the extent of evidence that's needed for qualification. And the two types of evidence we think about are analytic validation. So this would be um, sensitivity, specificity, accuracy, and reliability. And then uh, the second area is, is clinical validation. And I understand that for complex in vitro models, it's not necessarily exactly clinical validation, but I think the same concepts apply. We think about what the concept of interest is. So um, are you talking about uh, determining uh, the likelihood of a, a drug-induced livery injury risk for a novel compound? That would be the concept of interest. And cl the clinical validation evidence would be the evidence that shows that the complex in vitro model does indeed um, uh, provide uh, important information for that concept of interest. One piece of clinical validation is what I um, show here as benefit risk assessment. 
And of course, benefit risk is not the same as benefit risk for a new drug. Um, benefit risk has to do with the benefits for drug development of including the drug development tool in a drug development program. For instance, reducing the number of uh, preclinical studies that might be required or um, getting more information about the likelihood of a particular safety risk. Um, the risk of a drug development tool is the risk to patients if the drug development tool does not perform as it purports to perform. So there's more than one path to uh, validation of drug development tools. I've discussed the drug development tool qualification program, but there's also the drug approval process where pharmaceutical company sponsors can propose a drug development tool for use in their drug development program. And this applies to complex in vitro models uh, as well. And indeed, uh, complex in vitro models are um, commonly uh, submitted as part of uh, INDs. And the other part, uh, piece here is the scientific community consensus. And these are not separate. Um, they can often um, uh, lead, uh, advances in one area can lead to advances in others. So an example is for drug development tool qualification, uh, sometimes a tool is qualified for one use and then it's incorporated into drug development programs prospectively collecting uh, additional information that allows it to be used in a broader uh, range of, um, of ways. And I think this idea about the stepwise approach to drug development tool validation applies to complex in vitro models as well. So the specific process that we follow begins with a letter of intent uh, where the requester uh, submits the proposal for how their drug development uh, tool will work in the context of use. Uh, once we um, review that, if it's accepted, then the submitter uh, will um, provide a qualification plan uh, stating how they were going to show that their drug development tool uh, has analytic validity and uh, will meet its um, uh, demonstration for clinical validation. Once that's accepted by FDA, then the um, requester will carry out the studies and submit the data to FDA in a full qualification package. And if the data supports use of the drug development tool in that particular context of use, then it's qualified. And then, as I mentioned before, the tool can be used in any drug development program for that particular context of use. For use as potential drug development tools, um, complex in vitro models need to, of course, uh, provide reproducible results. They need to perform under well-defined quality control criteria, and they need to be developed for a specific context of use and be demonstrated to improve or be equivalent to the outcome of currently used techniques or to provide novel insights. Some of the considerations are uh, CEDAR, the Center for uh, Drug Evaluation Research, recognizes the need to evaluate and utilize new approach methodologies to improve our ability to predict safety risks in humans. We're committed to the principles of the three R's, replace, reduce, and refine of animal testing. Um, and uh, uh, evidence required to replace an existing method would of course be uh, a greater level of evidence than what would be needed to supplement uh, existing methods. However, as I mentioned before, it's important to recognize that methodologies that pertain to internal decision making by pharmaceutical companies are generally out of scope for qualification programs. Um, the context of use can address a gap pertinent to regulatory decision making, and I'll give you some examples of this in the next couple slides. Um, these are situations where current methods uh, leave uncertainty. And an acceptable context of use may provide the same information as obtained with the current method if it addresses the three R's or is better in some other specific way. So to give you some specific examples of potential contexts of use to consider, um, I'd like to review um, a study that uh, we did internally at FDA. Uh, and the um, reference for this material is shown at the bottom of this slide. FDA surveyed CEDAR review staff to determine uh, tech 
toxicology knowledge gaps could be potentially addressed by new methodologies such as complex in vitro models. One example is uh, drug-induced seizures in humans, which are, of course, a significant safety concern. Animal models can detect risk of seizures, but not the levels of exposure that are uh, associated with risk. New alternative methods with specific context of use to predict human relevant seizure risk of a drug, including cross-species relevance, could be developed to inform the safety of a drug's effect on the central nervous system. And for this use, a potential context of use statement might read, um, quote, use of a battery of in vitro ion channel functional assays to predict in vivo human CMAX levels of small molecule drugs associated with increased risk of seizures or absence of seizures. And you can, uh, can imagine similar language for uh, other um, complex in vitro models to be used for the same purpose. Another example is detection of risk of rare and idiosyncratic toxicities, which I think is relevant to the uh, specific example that you'll be focusing on here based on um, Nick's uh, talk earlier. Um, complex in vitro models could aid in, prediction, uh, in predicting the potential of a drug to induce rare and idiosyncratic toxicities. For example, drug-induced liver, liver injury mute-mediated toxicity, CNS toxicity. And for DILI, a potential context of use statement might address the use of a complex in vitro model as part of a weight of evidence assessment to predict a drug's risk of liver toxicity. And the last example I'll give of a, of a potential context of use is application in assessing the risk of embryo-fetal toxicity. Um, the International Council of Harmonization, ICH guideline S5R3, detection of reproductive and development, de, developmental toxicity for human pharmaceuticals, um, provides examples for which an alternative method could be acceptable for regulatory use in CEDAR. Uh, quoting from the guidance for pharmaceuticals that are expected to adversely affect embryo-fetal development, based on the mechanism of action, pharmacologic class, or target biology, it can be appropriate to confirm this activity in a qualified alternative assay. So based on this, a context of use could be written that enables the use of a complex in vitro model capable of detecting the potential for malformations or embryo-fetal lethality to reduce animal testing within in vivo embryo-fetal development studies. So with that, I'd just like to end with a couple uh, closing remarks. Uh, the Center for Drug Evaluation Research recognizes the need to evaluate and evaluate, evaluate and utilize complex in vitro models and other novel, novel methodologies to improve our ability to predict safety risks in humans. Validating a complex in vitro model for a specific context of use involves rigorous validation for the specific context of use in drug development. The context of use for a complex in vitro model could assess gaps and challenges in non-clinical safety assessment. And proposals for use of complex in vitro models for regulatory purposes can be submitted as part of the IND process or through the FDA DDT qualification program, I stand. Thank you for your attention.